Let's try and create something cool today. And um, lately I've been getting into uh, learning a little bit of Houdini on the side just to try stuff. And uh, one of the typical things that you see in there is this sort of curl noise effect. Um, where you see sort of these trails and stuff. And uh, I was playing around with it and I was trying to see whether I can do something uh, somewhat similar in Blender. And it turns out there is something you can kind of use uh, that's similar. And I figured we'd go through it step by step to create sort of a head filled with strands and um, sort of curling around and look kind of interesting. So I'm going to get rid of my screencast keys here for a sec. And I'm just going to import uh, an OBJ. That was supposed to say dude man, but there we go. Uh, and basically I want to have a whole bunch of strands inside this guy um, and have them look interesting, sort of fill them up and, and see how that works out. So um, just in case you were wondering, this was created with the MB lab add-on. Um, I'll include links to both the final file here and that I create right now and the um, and the OBJ and that kind of thing. So you can follow along and to, to this add-on. Um, I just want to save a little bit of time by having this set up because um, I don't think this is going to be a very short tutorial, but hey, there we go. Let's call this object dot dude. And one of the things we want to have a look at is right now, this sort of has an insight to it. So you can see once we go inside his head, it has like eyeballs and a bit of inside geometry. And I don't necessarily need that. I just want to have the shell of this to, to work properly. So one of the things we can do is actually remesh him. Let's see, uh, remesh, remesh, there we go. And if we use a voxel remesh, um, depending on how small we go, we can get more and more detail. So let's set this to smooth shading. Maybe decrease this to point uh, 0, 0, 0.005, there we go. And you can see we're actually getting the um, the polygons themselves. So I'm going to turn this off, add a subdivision surface, and put that up top. And as I add more subdivisions, if we go back to our remesh now, you're going to get a little bit more um, a little bit more smooth. And you can go as small as you want. Uh, let me turn off auto smooth here real quick. And um, yeah, it's up to you basically to see how far you can push your computer. Um, but in this case, something like this could work well. It is quite a bit of polygons, um, but we don't really necessarily need this guy right now because we're going to do two different things. So let me duplicate him first and call this one re mesh and hide him for now. And let's call this one emit dot. Um, yeah, or dude, there we go. So one of the things I would like to do is first create sort of an emitter. So if we go back uh, real quick and we look at these, you can see there's like a, a volume going on and these are particles, unfortunately. Let's see if there's any better um, sort of, yeah, examples. Not really, but that's okay. Um, I'll show you the uh, the render that I made, or I might have already shown you. But here you can see it's essentially a volume of points that we, we need to generate uh, these lines from. So let's start with creating that volume of points first. So another thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a plane. And this plane is going to serve as our point. So I'm just going to merge all of these at center. And now this plane is basically a single point, single vertex, you can see. I go in, um, I have one vert here down at the bottom. And uh, we're going to use that to, uh, to scatter over um, in a particle system to get that sort of as a base. So what I want to do with this guy is I have this emitter here and I want to turn on the, um, the remesh again. Now let me just make this a little bit uh, bigger rather, just so I can demonstrate something here. Um, and we want to have these these sort of yeah points inside. So if we're to add a particle system here. Um, let's set the frame start and end to minus one, and then just set the lifetime to something really high, and set physics to none. 
And that way we just have a static particle system we can use. Um, although right now nothing really seems to be happening. They're all at the bottom because we have multi uh, not multipliers, but modifiers and the uh, particle system is after the modifier. So what we need to do is just turn on use modifier stack. I'm going to set this to volume and then I'm going to set the viewport display here to 0 0.001, just so it's a little bit smaller. Now, one of the issues you can see is that I'm not really getting a nice uniform distribution. Even though I have even distribution ticked, we could try random and that could work. We could also try grid, but the problem with grid is it kind of goes outside as well. So what I want to do is I actually want to create an object that will more uniformly scatter these uh, particles. And let's see, um, I'm just going to leave these random order and whether I turn on or off even distribution, you can see there's always sort of more distribution towards the middle. Now, one of the ways we can fix this is actually setting this to blocks rather than smooth. And now um, as we up the amount of blocks and it's okay if they overlap a tiny bit, um, what you'll see is this actually works really well because the distribution will become more even. And as I up this to a higher amount, you can see this is distributed more evenly. Um, I think this is just a thing with the particle system. Uh, it's just the way it works. But to make sure we're actually getting a perfect um, a perfect distribution, I'm going to add this voxel remesh before. Um, and this will slow things down a little bit. But now that inside, if I turn this off, you'll see again, we have those inside eyes and mouth and they won't actually have any particles. Now turning this back on, we have a nice even distribution. Now, why do I want this even distribution? Well, obviously, if we looked at some of those examples before, um, if we're going to add a lot of points in here, we want to make sure they're not too clustered. And this kind of helps. Let's see if we turn on even distribution in this case. This helps a little bit more. Now let's turn this on to jittered. And this gives us a nice uh, sort of even looking distribution. Now, unfortunately, they are not very close to the edge. So let's see if we go back to random and it's just a case of playing with this. There we go. We have a whole number of them and this is never going to be 100% perfect. But that's okay. I'm not too bothered by it. Um, this works well enough for what we're trying to do. So um, I'm going to keep this at 50,000 for now. I might up this later on, um, but do note that obviously the higher number of base points we have, the slower this is going to be. Now for this um, particle object that I created, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a particle instance modifier. And really what this is going to do is going to create an instance of this geometry on every particle. Now, for some reason, the default amount is set to zero and we can leave everything else as it is. We don't have to worry about these being dead or unborn particles or whatever, because we want all of them anyway, because we created a static particle system. And now we have these 50,000 points that we can use to start scattering stuff from. Now, um, the way we're actually going to do this is we're going to create these lines by using hair. And we're going to then distort that hair um, to create this sort of curl noise effect. So what we can do is we can add a new particle system and set it to hair. And even when we hit use modifier stack, unfortunately, what happens is it doesn't read it out properly. So to do this correctly, we're actually have to, going to go in and we're going to have to um, apply this modifier. Now, before I do, and I'll probably regret this, but this is what we'll do here. I'm going to set this to 100,000 points. Now, if you're following along with this, um, I would maybe advise to start a little bit lower and just to kind of see how far you can push your machine. Um, I know I can do 100,000, but some stuff might slow down uh, further down the tutorial. So that's okay. I can always, uh, just either talk over it or, uh, or speed it up a little bit if necessary. So with this setup, what I want to do now is I just want to hit control a to apply that modifier. Um, and this works in 2.90 or 2.91 and up, um, with the new sort of particle or sorry, modifier layout. And now we can see we have these set up. Now I'm going to turn this guy off and we can see we have that shape. Uh, with all these particles in them. Now, if we go back in here, um, sometimes you kind of have to go in and out and then it might work. But in our case, the, one of the reasons it's not working is because this is set the vertices. I'm going to go back to uh, solid mode and you can see 
now we have um, all these hairs showing up. Now, the easiest way to set this up correctly is just to match the amount of hairs with the amount of points. And now um, each one, if we turn off random order, each point should have its own assigned hair. Now, obviously the hair length is kind of crazy. So what we're gonna do is maybe bring it down to something like 0.15. And we can always tweak this afterwards once we've adjusted the uh, sort of the flow of the noise and to see how nice it looks. Now, another thing if you've used hair before is you wanna up the strand steps to make sure you get the, um, get the correct sort of look. And this is also gonna determine the amount of vertices you'll have in that final object that has those curves. Um, now, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna add a turbulence noise and kind of show you the difference. So once we add this, you can see we get an interesting kind of flow. Um, and I could even turn down the size here a little bit. So see, if I bring this down, we can get that similar looking effect, um, but we wanna use something that looks even more like it and you know, you could debate, debate whether uh, it's the same or not, but the thing with the turbulence is it will work just fine. And here you can start seeing, um, if we go in closer, I see sort of the amount of uh, strands or the amount of subdivisions you have, and you could fix that by going back into the hair if you wanted to. And uh, see, as I up the strand steps, Things are going to get a little bit slower, but you can get a nicer sort of subdivided look. And depending on how large you're going to render this or how how big you want to go, um, you might need more or less steps. So um, do keep in mind uh, that if we up the segments here, we might get a little bit more detail as well. Um, but generally, you could start off with like five segments and five strand steps, and it's already going to give you a lot of points to work with, and you could always smooth them out a little bit. Now, we could do this with the turbulence, or we could look at uh, a completely different um, force as well, which is kind of interesting. It's a little bit buggy, but it, it does work. Um, but you need to sort of jiggle it a little bit. And this is the texture texture noise. And what this is going to do is it's actually going to give us that option of creating curl noise in a similar fat, uh, in a similar manner than to uh, sort of the Houdini curl noise. Now I've split up my uh, properties panel here because I want to be able to both um, have the texture in view. So I'm just going to hit new and I want to have the, um, the settings for the field. And now you'll see by default, nothing's really happening. So let me throw in a clouds noise here. And you can see, even though I've changed the texture, the field itself isn't affecting the hair any differently. And this is what I was talking about where it's a little bit buggy. If we just go into the strength and hit enter again, now um, it will affect it. Now our clouds are really quite big. So let's go to 0 0.01. And what you'll see, I'm gonna turn on use coordinates. Um, Nothing really seems to be happening yet. It's just pointing up. And that's down to this uh, Nabla setting. So if you turn this up a little bit, it'll actually start using that texture and start affecting the, uh, the noise field. So every time you change the texture, you just kind of have to update the, the texture in here, which is unfortunate. You can see um, you just kind of have to go in, just hit enter, and then it'll update. It's a weird little bug, but you can see we're already getting way more interesting uh, noise than we were getting with the turbulence. Now, we're not quite there yet because we can change the texture mode from RGB to curl. And now it's going to use those positions to sort of curl around. Um, but the problem is you can see I changed it here and nothing seems to change. Well, if you hover over the texture mode here, you can see RGB and curl need an RGB texture, else gradient will be used instead. So they actually haven't they've been using the same thing. So they've actually been using this gradient uh, gradient setting. So what we need to do is if we set the color here to color, now if we go back in and hit enter and give it a second, now you'll start to see that sort of 3D curly flow um, that you're getting in, in other software like Houdini as well. And you can see it is actually possible with Blender to get similar results. So we're about halfway there, I would say. Um, we've got our, our curl set up almost the way we want, and we can play with the size a little bit. So let's maybe go to like six, five. And again, we have to jiggle this. 
And depending on the Nabla setting that you set here, the curl will be pushed either a lot further. So if we set it higher, it'll curl in onto itself a lot more, but you want to make sure you don't have too many intersections. But the interesting part of this is that you get a lot of sort of crazy detail. And again, depending on the amount of strands you have, um, you can set them a little bit thicker later on if you need to. But this is a, an interesting looking design. Now, for the next step, what we want to do is, first of all, we want to create an object that we can manipulate more easily. And second of all, we want to sort of limit the, uh, the strands to be inside the volume of our dude. So let's move on to that. I'm going to close this back up. I quite like the way this is looking. And you can see because this is sort of volumetric noise the and we have the points scattered all inside, this is a complete uh, sort of volume. And even if you like this, you could start rendering this and you could use the hair to uh, speed up the rendering a little bit. Um, but right now we're just going to keep this uh, the way it is. I'm going to select this guy. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hit convert on the particle settings of the, uh, the, point, the point system here. And what that's going to do, it's going to take a second. It's actually going to give us a mesh. So now I can turn on, uh, turn off everything else rather. And again, this will take a second because this mesh is going to be quite dense. And this is, again, down to the amount of points that you specified when uh, you were setting up the strands. So I had a segments, I had about five segments for the, the amount of detail. And um, you can see if you get up really close, it's not super subdivided, but we're already dealing with three million verts. Now, we want to actually limit this to our uh, to our guy. So I'm going to make sure this file is saved. I saved it before, but if you haven't done that yet, uh, make sure to save it somewhere because we're going to use dynamic paint for this. And in order for the dynamic paint to work properly, you actually have to have the file saved so we could write the cache somewhere. If you don't, it won't write the cache and then it won't work right. So make sure just to save the file. Now, remember we had the original um, remeshed guy here and the reason we, re we remeshed him is so that when I turn this on, we have um, one sort of fixed volume and we could even bring this down a little bit. And sure, you're working with a lot of polygons, but you'd be amazed at how well this works even on, on um, a fair, some you know computers that are a little bit older or whatever. Um, so let's see what I'm gonna do for this um, because we don't really need the, uh, the original shell anymore. I'm just going to apply all the modifiers. And if you don't have these controls, um, go into the preferences and in your add-ons, type in modifier, and you'll get the modifier tools uh, that are shipped with Blender that you can enable. These are really great because they give you just a little bit of stuff. For example, um, you can turn off the view viewport visibility or turn on the viewport visibility, but you can also very easily apply all the modifiers. Um, you could do the same thing by hitting F3 and then typing convert uh, to mesh, which would work exactly the same way. But I like having this control in here so I can just very easily click. And now we have this guy set up. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to use dynamic paint to keep all of the um, all of the, the points inside the volume and delete all the ones outside. And if you've never used Dynamic Paint before, it's a really great tool. It allows you to do a lot of very interesting effects on many different levels. We're going to focus on uh, vertex groups right now. So with the Dynamic Paint, first thing I'm going to do, um, it always has two components, a brush and a canvas. And the brush is basically going to paint onto the canvas. So that means you want the object that is affecting the other object to be the brush and the object that's to be affected to be the canvas. So in this case, our guy if we turn on dynamic paint is going to be the brush. So we set this type to brush and we add it in. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to set him to uh, display as bounds here. So it's still in the viewport, but it's just being displayed differently. So we can focus on this second one. And the second one here, we're going to add in dynamic paint as well. And we're going to add a canvas. But in our case, what we want to do, we don't um, obviously we want to use the vertex format so we're painting into the vertices and by default this is using the paint uh, which is vertex paint but what we want to do is we use uh, vertex weight so if we set this to weight um, we open up the output you can see it's trying to output into this dp underscore weight uh, group but that doesn't actually exist so what we need to do is just create an empty group that's called that or you can call it something else and then set it up in the, in the dynamic paint but in our case, let's just set this up like this. 
And now once we go back to the dynamic paint, you'll see the group is no longer red. So it's able to find it and it works just fine. Now, another thing we want to do is now that we have that group, we want to use a second modifier after the dynamic paint. And that would be the mask modifier. There we go. And we want to tell the mask modifier, okay, I only want you to keep the dynamic paint weight um, group. Now, unfortunately, uh, this seems to be some kind of bug or whatever. If you go into edit mode and go back out, now all of a sudden you can see this works properly. And you can see we've limited these, uh, these points to all of the points that are inside the group. You can also flip this and then you would just get the outside uh, with which you could probably do some interesting stuff as well. But for our um, results, we want the inside. Now, the reason this works is because by default, if we go into the dynamic paint settings, um, the source is set to mesh volume. So that means um, it's using the volume of the guy, uh, of our dude here, and it's keeping, it's painting all of those points that are inside the volume into that group. And then in that mesh, we're telling it, okay, um, I want to use the mask modifier and I want you to keep all those points that we've painted in that group as a mask. So um, I'm going to duplicate this guy just in case I have to go back and maybe uh, redo some things because this next step is going to take a little while. Um, and first I'm going to apply all the modifiers. And now what we want to do to make our life a little bit easier and to be able to shade this properly, we want to convert this to a curve. So I'm going to hit save on this because I know this is going to take a while. And by a while, I mean it could easily take um, 10, 15, 20 minutes. So don't be surprised if you have a lot of vertices that it's going to take a very long time to convert. So I'm just going to hit F3 and type convert to curve. And now basically we wait. Now, obviously I'm not gonna bore you for 15, 20 minutes. Um, I'm gonna have a look at what time it is. So it's 10 past 12. Uh, I'm gonna leave the recording running, but I'm gonna cut this part out and we'll be back once that is done and we'll see what time it is and how long this took. So don't be surprised if this took a very long time. 20 minutes later. All right, so roughly 20 minutes later, uh, 17 to be exact. We can continue what we were doing and yeah, <laughs> I guess sometimes we have to suffer for our art, but basically I'm going to turn off this remesh guy as well. What we're left with now is a um, curve object with a whole bunch of points in it. I'm going to hit save and I suggest you do the same thing um, just so you don't have to do that again. But now the fun can actually start. So one of the things we want to do is actually give these thickness. And you might be tempted to just go, all right, bam, bevel it. But remember, you're dealing with millions of verts here. So in our case, we want to make sure we set the resolution to zero and the preview resolution to zero as well, or to one rather. Uh, I put in zero, but it defaulted back to one. And that means it's not going to do any sort of subdivision here when it creates that geometry. Um, if this is left to four, for example, it's going to take a long time to do, but let's put in a fairly small value, but now you can see we actually get that geometry. And, um, if we shade this smooth, we should even get a nice sort of smooth looking geometry. And in the newer versions of Blender, you can actually enable fill caps and you will get nice ends to that. And now we have a really interesting looking, uh, sort of volumetric curly man dude guy. So um, this works on a female model as well, obviously, or any uh, gender or non-binary or uh, however that 3D model identifies itself. Um, so yeah, that's basically the technique behind it. And um, it's up to you to kind of push this and see how far you can push it on your machine. Now, one of the things you can do to make it even more interesting is add a curve as a taper. And we'll give this a second because we're affecting the whole thing again. I'm going to set the depth to zero real quick because uh, that makes the whole thing just a little bit faster. I'm going to delete this point here. And I'm going to grab these two vertices, scale them out over X. There we go. I don't want to really, really scale that one because I just want to have the end sort of pinched. And then in item, I can set these to one. So now the thickness will be uh, one. 
And rather than having this set to a Bezier curve, what I want to do is I want to set this to a poly. And now it'll just be the straight line. But as we enable, and if I go back to solid view here, as we enable our depth again, and that's not going to be enough. So let's go back. And for some reason, it doesn't want to show me. Uh, taper, and I should have added it as bevel curve rather than a taper, I believe. Unless I'm... Okay, no, I just typed it wrong, it seems. Yes, should have added this as a bevel curve, not as a taper. So what we could do is set this to object, and then we'll use the taper one. Unless I'm completely off now. No, it was a taper. I've done this before. Weird. Anyway. Put this in. If we map it correctly. And it doesn't want to seem to work. That's okay. It's no big deal. Um, some other things you can do uh, to get this to look a little bit better as well is... Well, no. Actually, now I'm determined to make this work. So let's see. Is it because I converted it? Maybe that might be it. I set this back to a Bezier curve. Will it work then? I'm just trying to get the ends here to work, to sort of taper off nicely. Let's see. And this is really slow. So again, because you're dealing with a lot of these uh, points, this might get a little bit slow. There we go, and I will move these in a little bit as well. Maybe our taper is too small, so we're not actually seeing the effect. Although it's weird, it should just work normally. What if we... No, this is the wrong... I'm doing it on the taper object and not on the original curve, so there we go. That's weird. Should be working just fine. I had it working before, but I might just be missing something small. Anyway, no big deal. Um, let's actually get into shading this. Now, another way you could probably make this more interesting is by adding a bevel profile. The problem is you'll have to add in a lot of resolution. Um, so this isn't showing up right now. And I haven't really used this much before, but you can actually create a more interesting um, sort of strand rather than just having these be uh, normal sort of meshes. Now, one thing we can try, and again, we're going to save before we do anything. Um, let's see if I add up the resolution here. Will it add the taper in? No, it won't. Okay. Well, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, one of the things we could do is add in a subdivision surface. But again, add this at your own peril because this is going to get quite slow. And depending on how much RAM you have, it might uh, not want to do it. All right, so that took a few minutes, um, but it did it. Again, um, this is going to be quite slow. Your computer might crash if you do this because of the... Uh, the amount of memory that it needs. So I'm just going to turn this off and I'm going to leave it on at render time maybe, or just delete it altogether. Cause I want to talk about one last thing you could do just to add a little bit more detail into this. So if we go into our mesh here or into our curve, rather we go into edit mode. Um, we could do two things. We can either try and optimize it a little bit um, to make it a little bit easier to work with, or we can add some detail in and, you know what, actually let's do both. So first of all, I'm gonna hide this taper real quick and I'm going to delete that out there just so we have something we know we're working with. I'm gonna set the depth to zero uh, and just make a copy again. So now we can have our old one and our somewhat optimized one. So to optimize this, um, if you go into the curve, you can select everything and then change the spline type to Bezier. And this will give each point uh, curve handles, but what it will allow us to do is to decimate the curve. So 
I have to keep an eye on the amount of points that you have. So I don't know if everything needs to be selected, actually. Let me deselect everything and maybe we can get a better view on what's going on. And again, because we're dealing with so much stuff, it's kind of a pain in the butt. So what we could do with decimate curve, we could do anything if I put in a ratio here. No, because we need to have all of them selected and that's fine. So let's decimate this and we can bring down the number of points, which in general um, will just kind of help out with how heavy everything is. And uh, again, this takes a second because we're piping a lot of geometry in and it's going to need to calculate. Now, the problem is if you decimate too heavily, you'll see you'll get a lot of really weird angles and um, the curves might not work properly. So let's bring this up to something a little bit less. But even still, if we can get down to a quarter of the points or half of the points, um, it could be interesting to use. Now let's that let's let that calculate. So now when we go back out, we can see it kind of worked. Um, you can see you do lose a lot of resolution in those curves, um, and you get kind of angly stuff, which unfortunately uh, you can get back by adding resolution here. And you have a bit more fine grained control over how that would work. Now, again, the more resolution you have, you set this to 12, you're going to see we're back up to 6 million verts, um, which is more than what we had before. We have less control points. So again, it's up to you to how, you know, how you want to kind of go in and maybe, uh, maybe optimize this a little bit, but this could be one way to do it. Now let's keep using this one um, just to, Kind of do some other stuff and one of the other things we can do and let's see i'm going to hit save again make sure we go into our depth here we set this up this might take longer now because we technically have more um more yeah more stuff going on but now at least we can control the amount of subdivisions in the curve and we don't have to use a modifier which really slows things down you can see we're at 25 million faces which is absolutely bonkers um so if we bring this down to maybe six, we can always set the render resolution up higher if we have to. Uh, maybe set this down to four while we're working on it and make sure we can set the render resolution. Maybe we could set this up to like 16, um, but it's not going to affect the viewport in any way. Now let's get back to adding in a few more details. And one of the things we can do is um, we go into select and we select a few random points and maybe let's select 1% of random points. We can hit control L to select all the linked ones. And then in the mean radius, we can set this to maybe 0.5 or 0.25. Actually, let's do 0.5. What this is going to do is it's going to create strands that are a little bit less thick than the others. And um, I'm just going to get a little bit more detail in there. Now, it doesn't seem to be affecting them all that much, but I might have to go in and out of edit mode. Now, another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to invert the selection. So now we have all of the ones that are set to weight one. And then I'm going to do the same sort of select random. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to deselect. And that leaves me a group of, uh, let's say, maybe 98% of these. I can do the same thing by hitting control L. And now I have another group where the radius could be two or they're a little bit thicker. And you can see now if we go back out, and it did affect them a little bit. Now you can see not all the strands have the same thickness. And you could do this um, any way you wanted to and really go in and kind of go crazy. Now let's see if our taper would actually work in this case. Because I'm still wanting to get that to work properly. And I'm a little bit annoyed that it won't do it right. So what I'm trying to achieve with that taper is that sort of the ends of each, um, each line taper off. And it's unfortunate that they don't seem to be want to do that properly. So why aren't you doing what I want you to do? So maybe we need a little bit more resolution here. But again, the moment we start adding resolution to our bevel, you'll see you'll have more uh, circular resolution. And again, we're up to a lot of faces already. And it really is a shame that the taper won't work right. So fill the form shouldn't have any effect on it. Extrude it 
doing this won't help either, but it might activate the taper. Nope, but you can see as you can as you play with these values, you can get non-square stuff. Um, and yeah, I'm at a loss honestly why the taper isn't working. So I had it working before, but yeah, I'm not going to worry about it too much. You, know, you can see now we get uh, really interesting non-square stuff as well going on. But again, I want to set the extrude to zero. So we just have this guy. So now let's finish this off with a little bit of lighting and shading. Um, I'm close my panel here, open a second one so I can set up a camera and look through it. So I'm just going to set up a portrait camera, which is usually somewhere between 70 and 90 millimeters. So let's start with 70 and maybe we increase it if necessary. I'm just going to set this to a um, Instagram friendly size, let's say. And Let's see if we can find a more interesting look. So maybe something like this. There we go. Let's zoom out with that camera selected. Create a nice composition. We can always change this if we have to. And again, I'm not uh, out to create a perfect sort of final look, but just something we can work with and play with the shading. Just to show you a final little, uh, little bit of fun I've been having with these. And in the camera, I want to set the passport two to completely black. So now we can save this, set this to rendered. And depending on your setup, you might or might not be able to use the GPU uh, because we are dealing with a lot of geometry cycles. Unfortunately, can't render out of core on the GPU when the geometry doesn't fit. So we need to make sure there we go. We can add this and let's give this a little bit of backlighting. So let's move the light over here. Let me point this at him. So we have maybe this edge over here. Let's point this over there. There we go. Go for something moody here. Let's turn off our, um, our overlays. Maybe move this on the Y axis a little bit so we get that edge nicely lit. And then we can add another light just by duplicating. Maybe have that from the back. Maybe a bit more from the back. So we can leave a little bit up to the imagination. There we go. And maybe we can add one last one uh, from the top. So let's add another area light in. Just sort of light up the top of the head. This one could be a little bit higher. Maybe move that back a little bit. So we're just getting the edges of everything. There we go. And we can start with that lighting and do something fun with it. So I'm going to switch over to my shading view here. And with our object selected, uh, rather than adding in a new one, I'm actually going to use a shader that you can download from the Blender Artists Forum, which is a really cool thin film uh, interference shader. And if you don't know what that is, um, think of the sort of the, the things like an oil slick or um, like the surface of a bubble, for example, you can do some really interesting uh, effects depending on the angle of where you're looking at the object. So um, let's see what I'm going to do is I'm going to pen this and I'll add a link to the, uh, to the file or where you can download it. And um, so you can use it for yourself and bring it in. So I want to bring in a material and I've been using this car paint one, which is a lot of fun. And then we can just select it. And we get this little node group in a second. Come on, you can do it. There we go. And now we get shading that's based on the angle of, uh, of where we're looking at. So we can play with these main values and maybe bring this up a little bit. Set this to a thousand. We get like almost a, a rainbow effect. And depending on, you know, the, the angles that you're working with here. And you just play with these values a little bit. Um, if we bring up the roughness, then the colors will be a bit more visible. And we get this really interesting looking guy. And as a last thing, we just want to add in a little bit of depth of field um, to make it look a little bit more realistic. So generally, when you're doing a portrait, you'd be focusing on the eyes. So I'm just going to shift right click here to set our 3D cursor down. Add in plain axes uh, and empty, and I'm just going to call this camera dot 
focus and turn on depth of field set it to be the focus point and now you can see we get our guy into focus here so um yeah i would say that that's about it um i might tweak this a tiny bit uh but I'll, I'll definitely bring the uh, the final file up to scratch and uh, I'll give everything names and stuff so you can download it and play with it yourself a little bit. So there you go. It's just a very interesting technique, I think. Um, just to reiterate really quickly where we started from, um, we created the, uh, the sort of, where is he? This, uh, this blocky guy so we could get a bit more of a uniform distribution in our points. Um, and then we use that uh, that object that had those points in there. Now this is pointing up because I've turned on my, off my texture field and when I turn it back on, um, remember to jiggle the settings in the texture field um, after you've changed your, your, um, your texture up a little bit. And remember you need to use an RGB uh, color texture to create that noise. And then um, we used another remeshed version of him with our mesh uh, that we painted in and that we used, uh, here we go. So you can see we used dynamic paint to select the inside of that volume. And then we used the mask modifier to cut it out. And from there, we did all our convert to, uh, what you would call it? Where are we? Mesh number two, convert to curve shenanigans, which took forever. And, um, Unfortunately, yeah, I don't know why the taper isn't working. I'll, I'll look into it and I'll make sure that it's set up correctly for the final file. So you can actually play with it and see the tapered effect that I was talking about. Um, yeah, it's still, it's still bugging me. I don't know why it's not working. It's really weird. Because we do have it selected and oh, we don't want both of them. We just want the taper. Let's see if I can do one last ditch effort if you're still here i set this to poly does it work then nope so let's create a empty curve ourselves and see if that works so what i'm going to do is i'm just going to create a line and rather than Having it over there, I'm gonna hit Shift C. Let's just create it from scratch. And actually, let's just create a Bezier curve. That one I know it works. Set spline type to poly, and then subdivide it. Subdivide it twice because we want two points. Select those two points. And let me collapse this here for a second. Scale these out on the x-axis. There we go. And then move them up one uh, one unit on the y-axis. And now we can use that Bezier curve. So let me turn off the taper to remove any confusion. And let's hope it works now if I select the Bezier curve and make sure I have this one selected. Bezier curve. Ah, now it works. So there you go. We just had to draw it ourselves. And this is what I was talking about. Now you get these really nice tapered edges and that um, we save here. Remember I have the render resolution set up higher so if I just hit F12 to render, we can actually get a final version rendered out with those um, with those tapered curves, and it might look quite nice. Now again, this synchronizing object is going to take a while, and depending on your GPU, it might not fit on the GPU RAM, so you might have to render it with CPU. Um, again, we're dealing with lots and lots of polygons. Um, this is sort of a drawback of the technique I'm showing here, that if you would just render the hair, um, then that would work, but then you can't constrain it easily to a volume. So it's up to you what you want to do uh, with hair. This would work a little bit better. So it's doing the whole optics thing. And so let it render out. And again, I could tweak this a little bit more to get a final version, but with those tapered edges, you can see this looks a lot nicer because the curves don't have those hard points. And depending on the size of the, the curl noise that you set up, and and the texture that you use for the curl noise, you're going to get way different results. So a lot of experimentation is to be had, uh, to be done, and a lot of different, uh, yeah, results are to be had. So sorry for bumbling my way through it a little bit uh, with the taper, but sometimes you just have to struggle a little bit, apparently. So let's let this render. 
And again, I'll have all the files and everything uh, all saved for you. Um, so you can download them, pull it apart, try it about, try it yourself if you want to, and uh, just have fun with it. So our guy's showing up here. And remember, this is completely, this is a full volume. So all of the, the all of the, the strands are going inwards completely. You might be able to optimize this by making sort of a shell uh, with solidify of the mesh and then only using that for point distribution. Um, but it's just, it just, yeah, I just wanted to show you that it, something like this can be done in Blender with a little bit of patience and trying some stuff out. So with that said, um, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you next time. Have a good one.